I've been waiting for this divorce. I was dumbfounded when my husband, Daniel, aggressively pushed the divorce papers at me. A young woman stood next to him and smiled. So, you're the wife of Daniel? Now sign the documents. We will soon tie the knot. I won't forgive you for having an affair and a secret child, even if Katie does. My mother, who was standing beside me, said, Grandma, you're really awesome, but try not to overexert yourself because it's unhealthy. You are, after all, growing older. Simply relax. Jasmine, Daniel's mistress, sneered at my mother. My mom was never one to be intimidated easily, which was frustrating. Oh, you're unaware of that, are you? My mother remarked, grinning confidently. Explain what you mean. Jasmine inquired, obviously alarmed. You understand what I mean, don't you? My mother chuckled. I am Katie Stone, and my age is 41. I married Daniel 16 years ago. He was a classic playboy, a college student who was flamboyant, gregarious, smooth-talking, and constantly surrounded by girls. I avoided Daniel and had no intention of getting close to him since I didn't like playboys. I was unaffected by his appeal, in contrast to the other girls. Perhaps that's what caught Daniel's attention. He started hounding me for a date. Though I'm not very skilled at saying no, at first I was able to think of reasons not to accept him. But eventually, when my reasons ran out, and I began to feel bad for rejecting him so much. I consented to go out with him just once. It must have been a moment of weakness since I had no idea that choice would cause me to feel so deeply regretful. While still in college, Daniel co-founded a web development firm with his pals. Having put in half the cash, he was made CEO. The business took off fast because he was intelligent, adept at seeing trends, and had a flair for making ends meet. The business grew under the leadership of a college student. He even started to appear in magazines and gained a little fame. I started to distance myself from Daniel after that tragic day when we first started dating, because I felt like he was from another planet. This simply served to strengthen Daniel's resolve, and soon after I graduated, I felt a little pressured to be married. Unexpectedly, he proposed, Let's get married. I had not even thought of marriage, so I was at a loss for words. What's wrong? This is the part when you cry and say that you wish you could? Are you in such tears that words fail you? He inquired. That's not it, I said in response. It hurts, that's all. Any regular lady would shed happy tears upon hearing about a prominent college student's proposal. I apologize, but I believe it is too soon. I recently began my job, so until I get the hang of it, I won't be able to manage work and domestic responsibilities. Daniel corrected me right away, saying, You intend to continue working? Just give up. I'm providing enough money for the two of us. I soon discovered that Daniel was quite firm in his beliefs and never wavered after we started dating. I knew it would be useless to talk to him about this, but I didn't want him controlling my life. I had graduated from college, gotten a job, and I wasn't going to give up on my goal of continuing to work. I was determined, but Daniel's reasoning just didn't add together. I eventually said nothing, and it seemed to satisfy him. Are you suggesting that you would like to turn down my proposal, Katie? Daniel inquired. That's not it, I said in response. After that, it's resolved. Let's get everything planned now. We'll be occupied. He made the decision. I ran out of room to debate. Daniel was a well-paid professional, so there was really no reason for anyone to be against my marriage to him. Despite how I felt, I felt like I was caught in a whirlwind as everything rushed swiftly forward. Even though I wasn't quite delighted with the marriage, the lavish honeymoon and spectacular wedding gave the impression that I was living the ideal. But witnessing my mother's joy inspired me to concentrate on running our new house. Daniel trusted me to take care of the house 
as he became more and more focused on his profession. I felt somewhat satisfied by this, but it was fleeting. Daniel remarked, Katie, you should see a doctor. For what purpose? I inquired. For our first child. A long time has passed, and nothing has occurred. When may my folks anticipate some news, they ask. Although their relationship had deteriorated following our marriage, Daniel's parents had been stern and didn't quite approve of their ostentatious son. Despite Daniel's colorful habits, I thought his family liked me, and I visited them often. Daniel held on to certain antiquated beliefs, such as the desire to give his business to a son. This appeared a bit out of date, perhaps because of his rigid parents. We hadn't gotten pregnant yet, even though we didn't use contraception. Daniel appeared irritated, but I wasn't too concerned because I assumed it would happen soon. I mean, what good is it for me to go alone? I said, it's best if we do this together. What are you trying to say? I'm to blame, right? Daniel inquired. That's not what I'm saying, though. Compatibility is said to be a potential influence. I believe that because this impacts both of us, we need to go together. I won't have to go if they find something incorrect after you return. I'll go as well if they discover nothing. But for now, simply leave on your own, he said. I was angry that Daniel was attempting to place all the blame on me, but I figured there was no use in arguing, so that day I went to the obstetrics and gynecologist clinic. I experienced no problems and the findings revealed no anomalies. I told Daniel the results when he got home that evening. Why is that tone there? Are you implying that I'm to blame? He insisted. I said, I'm not saying that. I'm only disclosing the outcomes. Furthermore, I don't mind if we wait a little while longer for children. Did you not say that you would get checked if there was nothing wrong with me? Time will fly by swiftly, and nothing will change if you insist that we wait. Nothing is occurring because you're not treating this seriously. It's time for you to become serious. Daniel shot back. Are you serious? How do I go about doing that? Feeling irritated, I pondered. Was he really saying that I wasn't trying hard enough to conceive? Was he scared to see if there was a problem with him? In the end, Daniel never saw a physician, and we gave up on becoming parents. Without them, our lives went on, Daniel growing more and more engrossed in his job, staying up late, and communicating very little. Our union became estranged. I had too much time on my hands and thought I should take care of myself. I also thought about being financially independent in order to be independent of Daniel. I had always wanted to open a general store as a youngster. I wanted to try to go after that dream even if it didn't work out. As a result, I told Daniel about my plans. It had been a while since our last meaningful talk. A general store? What a farce, he remarked curtly. You've had this desire since you were a young child, but I won't help you achieve it. Proceed if you are still inclined to do so. I'm not going to help you out financially. Daniel's response was expected. In any case, I had not intended to seek his assistance. My mother's assistance was the sole reason I was able to launch my little business. Many thanks for it. I assured her that I would put in a lot of effort and pay her back. I was in elementary school when I lost my dad to sickness. After that, my mother raised me alone after starting a modest restaurant with the money from his life insurance and making it profitable. She is still a capable mother managing her little eatery. She responded, You don't have to pay me back. Work diligently and with that attitude. It will work out, I'm sure of it. I was sure it would. I took my time and was quite selective in what I chose for my shop. The store's reputation for high-quality goods helped it attract more customers every day, so it was evident that the effort was worthwhile. My mother's encouragement was like a powerful wind behind me. My life was busier, 
but I still made sure to take care of the chores. Before, it was all about waiting for Daniel to get home. In the hopes that he wouldn't hold my job responsible for any problems, I made sure to stay on top of the cleaning and washing as well as give Daniel's meals additional thought. Daniel was returning home later and later, and on other evenings, he didn't come home at all, despite my best attempts. Is it so hard for you to come home from work? I inquired. His comments were curt. Look after your own needs. You aren't growing younger. Put an end to it. Don't talk to me like my mom. Don't treat me as a stand-in just because you are unable to have children. He was obviously not feeling well that day. I apologize. I didn't mean to do that, I stated. At home, things are dull. Perhaps things would be different if we were parents. When Daniel was upset, he would accuse me of being the reason we didn't have kids, even though he never tried. When things didn't go his way, he was always the one to blame. How about tomorrow? When are you going to be home? I inquired. Please let me know if you're not coming back so that we don't waste meals. Do I need to let you know every time? The next day, just consume the remainder yourself, he answered. Daniel stopped addressing me by name at some point. I was offended and felt denigrated at first when someone called me you, but I ultimately became accustomed to it. The following day, Daniel also failed to return home without giving a reason. He rarely returned home more than twice a week. He'd come with a load of laundry, get clothing for a few days, and head off once again. But I didn't know what was going on behind my back. Hi, Daniel. Mind if I join you? She asked, her voice smooth and inviting. Daniel looked up, surprised, but intrigued. Sure, I'd welcome the company. Emily slid into the seat across from him her mind racing with the script she had prepared. She started with a light conversation, asking about his day and discussing the cafe's best offerings. As the chat progressed, she skillfully guided the conversation toward more personal topics. Daniel sighed, clearly agitated. You know, Emily, I'm really tired of the routine at home. It's always the same arguments and misunderstandings. I'm fed up with my wife. Emily leaned in, her expression sympathetic. I can imagine. Relationships can be exhausting, especially when they feel like they're going nowhere. Daniel seemed to appreciate her empathy, his guard dropping a little. Exactly. Sometimes I just feel like there's no way out. Ever felt like you're stuck in a dead-end situation? Emily nodded making a mental note of his vulnerability. All the time. It's easy to feel trapped when things aren't going well. But you deserve to be happy, right? She said slowly, sliding her hand into his. Daniel's eyes lingered on her, a mix of relief and curiosity. It's refreshing to hear that from someone who isn't a friend or family member. You seem to understand. Emily's smile widened. Well, that's what I'm here for. Sometimes a fresh perspective can make a big difference. We can go out if you want. Let out the stress you know. Daniel seemed to relax, enjoying the attention and the understanding he felt he was getting. Emily knew she had struck the right chord. Her goal was clear, to build a rapport and extract useful information. As their conversation wound down, Daniel looked at her with a genuine smile. This has been really nice, Emily. I'd love to talk again sometime, and you're really pretty as well. Emily returned his smile, her mind already working on her next move. Definitely. I'll see you around, Daniel. While cleaning Daniel's clothes one day, I came upon a t-shirt that wasn't his. Its size and style made it obvious that this was a woman's clothing. Strangely enough, I wasn't too surprised. I knew in my heart that this day would arrive. I faced Daniel head-on when he got home. Are you seeing anyone else? What are you saying? He asked. It's not your t-shirt, is it? I showed him the woman's clothing and added, 
It got mixed in with your laundry. Daniel seemed surprised for a minute, but he soon forced himself to act composed. It has to be from one of my office employees. How did it get incorporated? Are t-shirts actually removed by employees at work? Should you be perspiring? Wouldn't you adjust? Are you bored in any way? Isn't operating a general store essentially a playing shop? It makes sense that you have time to pry. To go on would simply fuel the flames of war. It's okay if it's nothing. I apologized for my suspicions and retreated. The same thing kept happening in spite of this. Clearly feminine goods such as handkerchiefs, jewelry, stockings, and undergarments were turning up in Daniel's laundry. The t-shirt felt like a purposeful challenge from Daniel's admirer rather than just a random gift. Someone obviously wanted me to notice. I collected all the mixed-in objects and placed them in a paper bag before giving them to Daniel after it happened many times. What is this? he inquired. I'm not sure how all of this ended up in your laundry, I said. It looks intentional, doesn't it? Daniel shot back, getting defensive and agitated. Cut it out. My line of work is not at all like your modest store. You accusing me of cheating while I'm putting in a lot of effort irritates me. You're really annoying. His defensiveness served to validate his own guilt. It sickens me to look at you. You are to blame for my extended absence from home. I remained mute as Daniel gathered his things and headed out. The door shut behind him, and I wondered what to do next. Could you just walk away from him? My mother's voice spoke to me in my brain. I can manage on my own, I thought. When I went to my mom's restaurant the next day and informed her about Daniel, she immediately gave me advice to end our relationship. I handed her the money for the month and added, I'm making enough to live on my own now. I was making enough money from my general store to be able to consistently pay my mother. You don't have to put up with him if you can support yourself, she stated. Have you recently taken a glance in the mirror? You seem terrible. I said, that's rude. But as I looked in the mirror, I started laughing. The image of myself in the mirror was startlingly worn out. You're accurate. I look awful. I ought to have said something sooner. I apologize for not noticing it earlier. Mom inquired, Do you still love him? To be honest, I stopped loving him. However, why hadn't I abandoned him yet? Was I too scared to own up to my mistakes? Or was it that I feared life would disappear like a bubble? I had no idea who I was. Daniel did not communicate for a month, presumably out doing whatever he liked. My shop diverted and kept me occupied. My phone rang as I was wrapping up. It was the hospital. Daniel required me to come right away for testing and maybe surgery after being taken in by ambulance. I couldn't drive, so I ordered a cab, but because it was a busy day, it would take 20 minutes. My mother promptly arrived to fetch me up when I phoned her. I apologize for disturbing you during this hectic period. What are you saying? She comforted me. It's okay if I open a little late. The only people who come in are the regulars. My mother drove, and we made our way to the hospital. We rode the elevator to the floor and made our way to the room after obtaining the room number from the reception. I heard laughing as soon as I walked in. Daniel's voice. What was in store for me was astounding. There was a young woman with a baby next to Daniel who was lying in bed. I've been waiting, Daniel replied, grinning at me. Complete the paperwork for the divorce. I was shocked when Daniel angrily thrust the divorce papers in my face. Jasmine, the young woman, gave a sly smile. Oh, you're the wife of Daniel then? Now sign the documents. We're going to get wed. It will be all right, Jasmine, so don't worry, Daniel said. It was then that I saw Jasmine dressed in the t-shirt that Daniel had thrown in with his washing. I felt like I had a horrible aching in my gut. 
Although appendicitis was the diagnosis, medicine was able to relieve the discomfort, avoiding the need for surgery. I was more concerned with the matter at hand than I was with finding out how Daniel was doing. Although I knew Jasmine was Daniel's mistress, I couldn't help but wonder whether the infant she was cradling was really Daniel's. Daniel called the infant his son, giving his head a gentle pat. He said nasty things, accusing me of being the reason we were unable to conceive. At last, my mother said, That's quite a cruel thing to say. Though she hadn't said anything until now, it was clear that she was irritated. Daniel seemed slightly taken aback upon seeing her. Oh, you are also here? My mother firmly said, Even if Katie could forgive you, I won't. Jasmine laughed, making fun of my mother. Grandma, you're really cool, but it's not good for your health to be angry. Try not to lose your cool. You're elderly. My mother was not easily intimidated, even when Jasmine tried to do so. Are you aware of that? She said, wearing a self-assured smile. What is it? Jasmine questioned, clearly nervous. My mother pushed. You must have an idea, right? Jasmine said, I don't know what you're talking about, as her nervousness increased. This grandma is really scary to me, Daniel. It was a ridiculous scenario. The situation was rendered even more absurd by Jasmine's feigned tears and defensive demeanor. I had signed the divorce papers and was ready to walk out when a woman and two guys in suits came in. The woman handed Jasmine a paper after displaying something that looked like a badge. Jasmine looked at it, her face becoming white. It was disclosed by the police that Jasmine was being held on fraud charges. Daniel was frantic, and I was even more perplexed upon seeing the arrest order. What's happening? Daniel insisted. Do you suspect fraud? Why? Jasmine was taken from her infant by the female cop, who then handcuffed her. Jasmine exclaimed, I did nothing. Daniel, please help me. A nurse intervened to hold Daniel as he attempted to get out of bed to assist Jasmine. Daniel was cautioned by the female officer that resistance would only result in more charges. Overwhelmed, Jasmine crumpled and started sobbing aloud. Stunned, Daniel could not move. Jasmine's screams resounded in the corridor as the male police took her away. Before departing, the female officer, who maintained her composure the entire time, praised my mother for her assistance. The way things had turned out perplexed me. What was taking place? My mother clarified that Jasmine had taken part in several fraudulent marriages. When I suggested that Daniel could be seeing someone else, my mother hired a private detective. The investigator's conclusions verified Jasmine's reputation as a prominent con artist. Mom intended to have Jasmine arrested when she arrived at the hospital, since they had images showing Jasmine's involvement in these frauds and had spoken with the police about it. How my mom's proactive attitude had resulted in this dramatic outcome astounded me. Daniel had laughed with Jasmine when she gave me the divorce papers, but now he had to deal with the consequences of her behavior. As my mother witnessed, I signed the divorce papers. My annoyance started to fade as I observed Daniel's confused gaze. I felt a sense of closure when my mom and I exited the hospital room. I put the divorce papers in my purse and told Daniel, good luck with that con artist. With a sense of resolve, I filed the divorce papers the next day. There was only a will to go on, not loneliness or melancholy. I went to the location Daniel had given me about a week later, and sure enough, that's where he, Jasmine, and their child were living. I had a range of feelings as I got closer to the apartment complex. While he was still with me, Daniel had begun a new family, but the baby's screams soon overcame these sentiments. After the arrest, the youngster was briefly housed in a facility. However, a few days after Daniel's release, the child went back home. I was startled by how different Daniel appeared when he answered the intercom, tired and gaunt. 
With a desperate tone, he said, Katie, you came to help me? Assist you? No way, I answered. My reason for being here is business. Daniel begged, Please come to my aid. I'm not capable of raising this child on my own. Though I was astounded by his ease, I had to keep in mind that the youngster was innocent. I walked inside, scooped up the wailing infant, and rocked him gently until he stopped sobbing. You're incredible, Daniel said. This is your first time even being a mother. The floor was littered with baby bottles, the table was smeared with formula powder, and the sink was piled high with unwashed dishes. Daniel grumbled about how hard it was to raise a child, how he had no idea what they needed, or how he spent his nights worrying. I gave Daniel the divorce papers and the paperwork about the assets I was entitled to while tending to the baby. What's this? he inquired, glancing at the documents. Calmly, I responded. It's the money I'm getting from you. Daniel's voice had gone from being pathetic to irate. Are you serious? This sum is absurd. Avoid becoming arrogant. He changed his attitude so abruptly that I had to giggle. You're exactly like I remember. I'm not kidding at all, I declared. I'm qualified for alimony and half of the assets. You were married to me for a while, but you had another family. This number seems reasonable to me. It was clear that Daniel was frustrated. I had to start another family because of you. His excuse did not come as a surprise. I had assumed this would be his argument because I had done a good job of managing the household while working. Though it didn't hurt as much as it could have, it was still wrong to suggest that not having children was a good reason to cheat on your partner. Want to take this to court to fight it? I made a challenge. The sight of a couple suing one another would be impressive. Daniel, you know that it would be expensive, and that you would lose. Daniel realized he was out of luck. He was not the kind to fight pointless fights. Okay, I'll pay you what you ask, but could you kindly look after the baby until Jasmine returns? I'm unable to work at all. Do you think I'll help you? I answered. How many more insults must you give me? Is it truly your belief that I will look after your child till Jasmine gets back? In one of Daniel's last-ditch attempts to get me to stay with the baby until Jasmine returned, I said no. You're not going to get away with disrespecting my dignity. I could not possibly assist you. Would you mind asking your parents? I did already, but they rejected me. Daniel looked despondent and continued. They said they'd never approve of me marrying someone arrested for fraud. Daniel's parents came to apologize for their son's acts the day I filed for divorce. Their denial of him was expected considering their personality. Because of Jasmine, Daniel had lost everyone, even his parents. Jasmine's mother vanished when she was a little girl, and she survived by con artists since she had no relatives. Although I sympathized with Jasmine, her difficult upbringing didn't excuse her behavior or encourage me to lend a hand. I responded icily, Get the money ready and get Jasmine back yourself. I found out a few days later that Jasmine had been granted bail and had gone back to her house. In an out-of-court settlement, several victims consented to receive compensation and alimony but I didn't think Daniel had much money left in savings. Jasmine seems to have received a sizable sum of money from him before their marriage. On their subsequent visit, Jasmine and their kid joined Daniel. He was sobbing and pleading for assistance. I need you to give me everything without splitting it up now that I need to sell the house and divide the assets. I was shocked by his boldness. He still asks for help today. Though I wasn't surprised, I can't help but feel sorry for my ex-husband. I've already told you, Daniel, that I won't forgive you and that I won't try to assist you. But I'm going to give you one choice. I had already thought of a strategy. 
You old granny, you're so conceited. Which choice? Sulking, Jasmine cut in. I said, your company, give me the company. Jasmine's disbelieving voice increased. Do you really think this way? I will not be giving it to you in any form. Daniel said, you're the one talking nonsense. His voice quivering. You turn over the business or give up on the settlement. There isn't an alternative. Alternatively, you may try talking to someone else. I said. I was aware that Daniel was without other support, and that it was important for him to give up the business, especially since he had dreamed of founding and expanding it. I had stood by his side through its beginnings and development. I chose to take everything away for that exact reason, the way he disparaged me in our shared existence. I made the decision to take away something I had worked so hard to achieve something he probably treasured. Let Jasmine spend some time in jail if you detest it so much, I remarked. She doesn't seem to be regretting anything. You elderly woman, are you indifferent to this child's future in the event that I go to jail? Do you not have sympathy for them? Daniel shot back. Women who aren't able to have children are really cruel. There was no sense in talking about it anymore. Daniel was obviously out of touch with reality based on his reaction. I had invested a small sum of $220,000 that I had saved from my allowances, holiday money, and part-time jobs during my time in high school and college when Daniel was first establishing the business. I invested the entire sum, which was substantial for me in order to help him. That choice might now be my saving grace. At first, I didn't own enough shares to be regarded as a shareholder, but I acquired their shares after Daniel's tyrannical actions drove away his partners. I now own 50% of the business, while Daniel keeps the other 50%. Daniel had no other asset save the property and these shares. The only way I can help you is if you give me all of your shares. Put differently, you have to offer me the firm. Why should you purchase it? Daniel demanded, clearly not believing. Daniel didn't say anything, knowing he didn't have an option, but was unable to voice it. I take it you intend to transfer the shares? I applied pressure. You're planning to sell the business, correct? I persuaded him, but he was unable to reply. This is your final opportunity, folks. Are you planning to transfer ownership of the business? I started strongly. With a pallid appearance, Daniel grudgingly said, All right, I'll give it to you. What are you saying? What will we do if you leave the company? Jasmine let out a cry. Because you were a co-owner, I married you. I have been duped. You are a phony. This woman is not someone to be pushed around. I couldn't resist laughing at their anguish. Are you not going to do what I say? I asked, trying not to chuckle. Jasmine? Her anxious face was directed at me. What do you mean? Perplexed, Jasmine inquired. The alimony, I murmured. Were you truly of the opinion that Daniel would bear sole responsibility? Is it necessary for me to pay? Jasmine made a demand. Daniel turned to face her, but he only dropped his head in resignation. I responded, you tore my family apart. You will, of course, have to pay. The total pay is $30,000. Jasmine argued, I don't have that kind of money. It's not my concern whether you have it or not, I answered. We will take you to court if you refuse. While you're out on bond, I'm interested to see how the trial will proceed. Jasmine shouted out, distraught. I just wanted to be happy. Why is this taking place? It's entirely your fault. Happiness cannot be constructed on the pain of another person, I remarked. Wishing well for others also brings happiness. Perhaps Jasmine will see that eventually, I said. Go through my lawyer for anything else. Take your beautiful wife and go for the time being. While Jasmine cried and screamed, 
Daniel discreetly took her hand and guided her to the door. It closed, and there was stillness once more. I then acquired all of Daniel's shares and took over as the business's new owner. Daniel and Jasmine received nothing from the settlement, since the money from the sale of the shares was used for it. They must be worried about their future, but that doesn't mean I'll be forgiving when it comes to the distribution of their assets or their pay. I'll make sure I get paid all that's due. I'd want a little more time, please. It was all taken from me by the settlers. I can't even make ends meet. I don't even have a job, Daniel begged. I have an idea, I answered. Why do you not work for me at my shop? I'm understaffed and very busy. I could employ you and take that money out of your pay. Can't I at least go back to my previous employer if I have to work for you? Daniel said, You're busy too, and I'd be an asset there. I know we're busy, but I don't plan on employing you again. You are not necessarily there. I'll hire you in my store if you're willing to be a shopkeeper, I offered. As long as I received the owed assets and compensation, I didn't care how he handled it. That was all that concerned me. Daniel declined my offer to work at my store and took a position as a laborer at a construction site, indicating that he was plainly offended by the prospect of working at my business. The amount he owed was the same no matter where he worked. I followed up with him if the payments were even a day late, and I made sure to verify each month that they were made on schedule. He ought to be appreciative that I'm letting him pay now in installments. Jasmine is now employed by me at my business, where she cleans early in the morning before Daniel begins his shift. She receives no remuneration from me. All of her income goes straight to me. She is upset about it, but it is unlikely that she will find another job given her little child and the fact that she is free on bond. Her only option is to work here. How much longer will Jasmine put up with this boring job when she's lived such a glamorous life by tricking so many men? I pondered. Since he was the COO, Daniel's salary has drastically decreased, and their lives have become quite challenging. They appear to be fighting all the time, and it looks like they will soon part ways. In the meantime, sales at my shop are still rising, and we've even started selling online because running the store and the business is too much for me. I've had to hire extra employees. I even asked my mom if she might assist me by closing her little restaurant, but she said no right away. My mother smiled and added, Please don't take this job away from me. It's my passion. Right now, her grin gives me motivation. I'm having a great time at work. My boyhood ambition of owning a general store has come true, and I feel like I'm taking excellent care of it. I've known the company I took from Daniel since I was a small child, so it holds a particular place in my heart. As I watched my reflection, I thought about how far I'd come. The journey from that challenging period to now has been filled with trials and triumphs, but every step has led me to this moment of fulfillment. I remembered the early days of the general store, when it was just a small dream. Each day, as I walked through the aisles, I felt a deep sense of pride in what we had built together. Reflecting on the past, I knew that every challenge had shaped me into the person I am today. The long hours, the difficult decisions, and the sacrifices had all been worth it. My team and I had worked tirelessly to turn the store into something special, and it was gratifying to see our efforts paying off. The support from my team was invaluable. They had become more than just colleagues. They were like family. We shared a common goal, and their dedication and hard work were a constant source of inspiration for me. Every success, no matter how small, was a testament to our collective effort. Mom's encouragement had been a driving force throughout this journey. Her belief in me, even when things seemed bleak, had kept me going. I cherished our moments together, whether it was discussing business strategies or simply enjoying each other's company. 
Her pride in my achievements made every challenge seem worthwhile. 